Is this the greatest grand touring sports car in the world? It certainly feels like it. Over a century of Bentley history has seen the crew company bring us many legendary models, but the Continental GT has outsold all of them combined. And in this third generation, guys, it claims to be focused as well as fantastically luxurious. We've heard that claim before, but this time this car's been engineered to deliver on its promises. Brutal performance, sophisticated technology and elegant design continue to characterise this model's plutocratic appeal. But it's now also sharper, smarter and easier to live with. In short, it's the kind of car W.O. Bentley would have been proud of. Early Bentley models were sports cars. More recently, the brand has been primarily known for its luxury GTs. Can the company really produce a car able to combine both these attributes? This model, the third generation Continental GT, claims to be able to do just that. And together with the Bentayga SUV, it's crucial to the future of this famous automotive brand. No pressure then. It's no exaggeration to suggest that without the original version of this car, launched back in 2003, then updated in 2011, Bentley wouldn't still exist as an automotive maker. Not in the form we know it today, anyway. While the company's exclusive limousine-style saloons sell in fractional numbers, this model series keeps the eco-friendly production lines in crew purring along at the rate of over 5,000 sales a year. An impressive return for the Volkswagen-owned manufacturer, given that the Conti GT in its first two generations of life was a good car, but never a great one, hamstrung by fundamentals borrowed from an old-fashioned Volkswagen Phaeton saloon dating back to the turn of the century. This Continental was a consummate Grand Tourer, but it wasn't really a choice for driving enthusiasts. This Mark III model, in contrast, shares its lighter, stiffer MSB chassis with the very latest generation Porsche Panamera. That car also donates a quicker reacting dual clutch gearbox, plus there's a more sophisticated four-wheel drive setup, much better weight distribution, sophisticated adaptive air suspension, and an active anti-roll system, all of it helping to make the car more agile through the bends. In short, don't be deceived. This third generation car may look quite similar to its predecessor, but everything here has been taken to another level. Most notably, we're told, in terms of the driving experience it can offer. No longer is this merely a car for cruising to the Riviera. Now it could take in a lap or two of the Nürburgring on the way too. Which makes all the difference to its sales proposition. Previous Continental GTs were refined, luxurious and lovely to drive, but they wouldn't really have satisfied customers otherwise considering focused super sports GTs like upper-spec Porsche 911 turbos, Aston Martin DB11s or possibly the Ferrari GTC4. Bentley claims that this one can. So, should lottery winners form an orderly queue? Let's find out. So what's it like? You expect a drive in a Bentley to number amongst the world's great automotive experiences. And behind the wheel of this one, there's no disappointment on that score. Ease yourself behind the wheel with an admiring glance at the handcrafted leather and veneered wood and press the large, prominent central starter button. As the seat belt tightens around you, the handcrafted 12-cylinder engine up front in this W12 variant growls into life with an oral signature that owners of previous generation models will recognise to be a touch more potent this time around. You're ready. Much is being promised here. Older Continental GT models were peerless grand touring machines, but they were never sports cars, despite Bentley's best efforts. We're promised this Mark III model can be, because it was created to be. Previous generation versions of this car were essentially given what was available from the Volkswagen Group parts bin. But with this car, the Bentley team were actively involved in the development of all the main engineering elements and got exactly what they wanted which was the ability to more precisely control this model's prodigious weight and dynamic demeanour. 
The whole car is much better balanced for a start because the engine's been set 150 millimeters further back on the lighter, stiffer Porsche Panamera derived MSB chassis that the British brand has re-specified to its own exacting requirements. That platform also helps to deliver a useful 80 kilogram weight reduction for this third generation model. And the damping's far more sophisticated too, thanks to Bentley's dynamic ride control 48 valve active anti-roll bar setup. Here, electric actuators work to either loosen or stiffen the anti-roll bars depending on the way you're driving. They're slack and loose when you're in a straight line to allow lots of wheel deflection, while in a corner they quickly stiffen to reduce body roll. As you might expect, dynamic ride control is connected up to a driving mode system with selectable options you can access via this rotary dial around the starter button below the gear stick. As usual with packages of this sort, these settings influence ride quality, throttle response, steering feel and gear change timings, which come from the new much slicker shifting 8-speed PDK dual clutch auto gearbox, another thing this third generation model has borrowed from the Panamera. You'll find the usual comfort and sport modes, but you don't get an auto drive setting that chooses the ideal settings for you, because this car provides something better, a dedicated Bentley mode that sets everything up as the engineers would ideally recommend. Alternatively, you might want to adjust the demeanor of this Bentley to suit your own particular, more varied preferences, much as a professional driver would set up his race car. In that case, you'll turn to the custom option that works across three parameters, engine and gearbox, ride and handling, and steering feel, allowing you to select from three choices in each case, sport, Bentley, and comfort. So you can get a throaty exhaust note and a soft ride, if that's what you really want. Another key factor in the way that dips, crests and undulations that would have slightly upset the previous model are here simply massaged away is the standard air suspension. It uses a three chamber setup now offering 60% more volume than before and as usual with these kinds of systems is adept at lowering itself on the highway for greater cruising stability. At higher speeds of this sort, you also get the benefit of an electrically retracting rear spoiler, which automatically rises to an angled sport setting to increase downforce. Whatever the road you're on, you'll enjoy electric steering that's now much more pleasingly weighted, thanks no doubt to input from Porsche. Plus there's torque vectoring to help maximise traction through the bends. And of course, as ever on a Conti GT, there's permanent four-wheel drive, the kind of thing you still don't get on a rival Aston, McLaren or Mercedes, and a real boon if you've to travel in icy or snowy conditions. Bentley calls this system active all-wheel drive, a setup that's this time determinedly rear biased, becoming even more so when you select the sport driving mode that pushes around 85% of torque to the back axle and sees the engine note ramp up to more of a menacing snarl. The result of all this sophistication gets remarkably close to the engineering objective that this car should be able to be S-Class like one minute and then 911 like the next. When the GT model line was first launched, it simply wasn't possible to make a sports car out of something 2.2 tonnes in weight. What we've learned here is that now, thanks to all this technology, it almost is. There's still a fractional hesitation on turning that reminds you of this car's prodigious size, but otherwise, once you're familiar with this Bentley, you'll find that it can be a proper partner in performance, rather than merely the kind of very fast, very luxurious sporting conveyance that its predecessors were. Which is just as well, given the power available to you beneath the bonnet. Earlier we mentioned the engine of the W12 variant we're trying here, the lesser designation referencing a unique W configuration that makes this power plant 24% shorter than an equivalent V12, benefiting weight distribution and maximising usable cabin space. It's much the same 12-cylinder, 6-litre twin-turbocharged TSI engine as is found in the brand's Bentayga SUV, but here it puts out slightly more power, 635 PS, which, by the way, is 45 PS more than was available in the previous generation W12 Conti model. Bentley has developed other petrol engines for this car. You can ask your dealer about a Porsche-derived 4-litre V8 and a plug-in hybrid that mates a 3-litre V6 with an electric motor, but it's the W12 that most customers tend to want. 
In comparison to the Bentayga, it certainly helps that this power plant has around 150 kilograms less to lug about, so it's not surprising that performance is astonishing, with 900 newton meters of torque on tap available from just 1,350 rpm. A mere brush of your brogues on the throttle at virtually any speed is all that's necessary to purposefully propel this car towards the horizon. Steering wheel mounted gear shift paddles are of course provided and this time they actually turn with the wheel which makes manual mode motoring that much easier. If the dedicated sport launch setting has been engaged, the 62 mile per hour sprint can be dispatched in just 3.7 seconds on the way to an unrestricted maximum that's theoretically pegged at 207 miles an hour. It's not manically thrilling in the way a rival McLaren or a Ferrari might be. This Bentley's too cultured for that, but it's certainly supercar fast. Turn the stability control system off in the way a potential owner never would, and sideways slides are apparently even possible, assuming your palatial pad has its own private test track. All of which makes it just as well that the brakes provide enormous stopping power, courtesy of discs, 420mm front and 380mm rear, that are claimed to be the biggest ever fitted to any production car. All of this is nice, but ultimately perhaps irrelevant for the kind of life this car is actually likely to lead. A pampered existence easing its owners between their penthouses and their private yachts, which means that it must cover all the core Bentley attributes too, as of course it does. It's all very well talking about comparably priced sports cars like Aston Martin's DB11 and McLaren's 570 GT as potential competitors, but there's simply no question as to which set of keys you choose for a longer journey, or even at the opposite extreme, a trip to your nearest designer fashion outlet. The beautifully judged ride quality is one reason for this. Road expansion joints and tarmac tears vanish beneath you with a distant thud and even speed humps fail to transmit much of a tremor to the cabin, though you'll feel certain poorer concrete highway surfaces courtesy of the huge wheels. But you'll hardly hear your surroundings. Peerless refinement is this time round aided by the addition of a dual mass flywheel to the W12 engine, along with laminated acoustic glass for the windscreen and side windows. And of course, the all-round visibility you get from something not quite so low slung is enough to make you want to take this Bentley on the kind of mundane trip that would perhaps see you leaving a more exotic rival in the garage. Which means that you'll be able to enjoy this car more often and therefore enjoy it all the more. You can of course pay much more than this in pursuit of automotive perfection, but after experiencing this Continental GT, we can understand why you simply wouldn't want it. Virtually nothing about this third generation Continental GT is shared with its predecessor, though if you're familiar with previous versions of this car, that isn't the impression you get from merely a casual glance. Initially, the look might appear much as it was before, with brand heritage ever present, the familiar power lines and emphasised rear haunches echoing the original 1950s R-Type Continental model. But look again. Every exterior panel has been changed to sharpen and modernise the exterior, and the new MSB platform has allowed the car to become longer and lower, with a lengthier wheelbase and shorter overhangs that create a much sleeker sort of GT. Especially from the front, where the gorgeous headlamps have been likened to spinning chandeliers. After the controversy of the Bentayga, it's all quite refreshing. From the front, this could only be a Bentley. It could only be a Continental GT. There was no real need to change the essential look of the original Raw Pires pen design, so the company hasn't, concentrating instead on evolving it. The classic meshed front grille hides sensors for this third generation model's more advanced safety kit and is now much larger with chromed finishing that can, as here, be optionally mirrored by the mesh covering the completely restyled lower intake further down with its corner cutouts that incorporate these piercing LED fog lamps. It's the jewel-like twin LED matrix headlamps mentioned earlier though that most keenly catch the eye. Inspired by the finest cut crystal glasses, the internal surfaces are transparent with sharply defined edges that catch the light like a diamond, with a result similar to that of an illuminated gem. This effect can be further magnified by an optional welcome sequence that gradually illuminates the headlights as you approach the car. 
From the side, the changes made this time round are slightly less obvious, but equally significant. This Continental GT's profile is longer and lower, due in part to the positioning of the front wheels 135mm further forward, which in turn allows the bonnet to be extended and the nose to be lowered. Despite this much shorter front overhang, overall length has increased by 44mm and the lower flanks have gained this chromed strip, which culminates just before the front wheel arch with this smart and emotively branded vent. The 12 here designates the number of cylinders beneath the bonnet. These aluminium body panels are fashioned using so-called superform technology that involves heating the alloy to 500 degrees centigrade before it's shaped, which is what allows for these more complex and sharply defined body creases. This is the first production car to have an entire body side created through the superformed process. Otherwise, key aesthetic signatures from previous models still dominate. Notably, this so-called power line, which travels from the front wheel arch and flows just above the door handle before reaching this exaggeratedly curving crease there to emphasize the muscular rear haunches we referenced earlier. The wheels are a size larger than before, 21 inch rims being standard. We've got optional 10 spoke painted rims here with 22 inches available on request. Nestling between those spokes lie 420 mm steel ventilated disc brakes, the biggest ever seen on a production road car. Perhaps the greatest stylistic departure for this third generation model though can be found here at the rear. The rhomboid tail lights of the two previous designs weren't especially pretty. These oval LED lamps are more elegant, styled to reflect the silhouettes of the chromed exhaust tailpipes below them. Further up is an electrically retracting spoiler so subtly incorporated into the composite plastic boot lid that you'd hardly know it was there. It rises to either eco or sport settings, in sport mode deploying to a greater angle. Of course, as usual, what's of greater importance is what lies below the sleek panel work, a monocoque built from a mixture of aluminium and high strength steel that's very different from the D1 Volkswagen Phaeton sourced underpinnings used by the two previous models. Beneath the surface, the fundamentals this time round are much the same as those that underpin this car's close cousin, the second generation Porsche Panamera, which, as we said earlier, shares this car's advanced Volkswagen Group MSB platform. In fact, the entire body in white, the basic structure of this car, is first assembled at Porsche's factory in Leipzig before being transported to Bentley's state-of-the-art plant in Crewe for full assembly. Time to take a seat inside and get to the part of this car that will probably really sell it to you. Bentley talks of its unrivaled expertise when it comes to the creation of exquisite interiors. It's a claim which might be disputed down the road at Rolls-Royce, but one that's difficult to doubt when you open the vault-like door and survey the extraordinary richness of the detailing and craftsmanship on display here. As the usual belt butler eases the seat belt buckle forward over your shoulder and you settle in, you'll find yourself surveying a dashboard sculpted by long flowing wings that mirror the shape of the Bentley badge with a floating leather top that now curves seamlessly round into the doors rather than stopping short at each corner as it did in the old model. As usual, there are bullseye vents with organ stop controllers plus a classic company clock. Both these things in this case surrounded by gorgeous optional diamond knurling, which uses a detailed three-dimensional faceted surface. On request, the vents, the clock and the whole of the lower part of the center console can be set into an intricate 0.6 millimeter thick Cote de Genève finish, apparently inspired by the delicate mechanical surfacing inside the finest automatic Swiss watches. Further up, the fascia trimming is even more opulent. Over 10 square meters of wood is used in every Continental GT, and it takes over nine hours to create and fit these wooden inlays by hand. Here, they feature the optional dual veneer finish that Bentley has introduced with this model. The only interruption to the sweep of this glistening timber panel around the cabin is this center dash infotainment screen, though that doesn't have to be the case. If, as here, your car has been fitted with the pricey optional Bentley rotating display, when you power off, the screen rotates, gliding elegantly into the dash, instantly softening the atmosphere of the cabin and providing you with what Bentley calls a digital detox. 
Unfortunately, there's no option to have this completely veneered surface when you're driving, but when you're on the move, you do have the choice of turning the panel to its third face, which gives you three little old-style analogue dials for air temperature, a compass and a stopwatch. One poor engineer apparently spent a year working on the correct operation and alignment of this spinning display, and the result of all that effort will be a real cabin talking point. Not everything's perfect, of course. You reach down below the gear stick for the infotainment system rotary dial that you'd expect to find on a premium model of this sort, and find yourself grasping the drive controller instead. It turns out that the centre dash display we just mentioned must be managed either by various buttons or by jabbing away at its touchscreen functionality, unless you're prepared to try and master the intricacies of voice control. At 12.3 inches in size, this display isn't the biggest you'll find in the premium class these days, but it's a lot better than the restricted 8-inch monitor you get in a Bentayga. It certainly manages all its audio, navigational and informational functions well enough. These including Apple CarPlay, though not Android Auto smartphone mirroring, a 4G mobile Wi-Fi hotspot and a 60 gigabyte hard drive. We'd want the optional name for Bentley 18 speaker 2200 watt audio system too. If there's a better in-car hi-fi system currently available in any car in the world, we haven't heard it yet. Most of this content can also be shown in the configurable centre panel that lies between two main virtual gauges on the MMI instrument binnacle screen, which look a lot more like real dials than is usually the case with these sorts of setups. Arrows on the left-hand steering wheel spoke allow you to scroll through the various options provided to brief you in the centre part of this instrument layout. Trip computer, audio, phone, navigation and, if fitted, night vision. The similar instrument binnacle screen setups that other manufacturers offer give you the option of making such features expand to fill the entire display, which is quite useful to be able to do if you've paid extra for the kind of head-up display we've got fitted here and you've already got the key elements of driving data in your eyeline. Here, a little annoyingly, all you can do is remove the right-hand speed dial by pressing this view button. The stitched leather's exquisite too, particularly with the optional diamond-in-diamond diamond quilted finish that's fitted here as part of the optional Mulliner driving specification pack. Apparently, 712 stitches go into each small embroidered diamond. This styling package features on the doors, but is most notably evident in the upholstery of these sumptuous chairs. Seats have always been a handcrafted Bentley speciality, and these ones really are superb, featuring a 20-way power adjustment and heating, plus optional ventilation and a six-programme massaging system. But have the designers nailed the practical stuff too? Well, yes and no. This piano black centre console surface smudges easily. The steeply angled windscreen pillars create a bit of a blind spot at roundabouts and angled junctions, and rearward visibility is somewhat compromised by the restricted size of the back window, so it's just as well that there are plenty of gadgets to help you park. As for stowage space, well, we'd like to have seen larger door pockets, an overhead sunglasses compartment, and a glove box not so space compromised by media equipment. But otherwise, cabin storage provision is largely fine. Lift this rather stiff folding top between the seats, and there's a shallow area complete with twin USBs, an aux in point, and a 12 volt socket. In addition, there are two cup holders under a rotating lid below the gear stick. Plus, you get a small narrow side ledge in the passenger footwell, ticket clips in the sun visors and coat hooks behind the headrests. We also talk about the rear seat too. Despite the fact that most owners will most frequently use it only for fashionable coats and designer shopping bags, this GT, like most others, is described as a 2 plus 2. But as others have pointed out, it's important to remember with Grand Tourers that 2 plus 2 rarely equals 4. Pull forward the seat back and the base glides forward to let you in. Then you take a seat, pull that seat back towards you and then watch with vague alarm as the base glides back to your knees, threatening to crush them rearwards. It doesn't, of course. There's a neat detente in the electric mechanism to ensure that'll never happen. Still, the fact is that it's impossible for an averagely sized driver to be ideally placed up front with an averagely sized adult passenger sitting behind. 
Given the wheelbase increase of nearly 100 millimetres this time around, we'd hope for more. To be fair, it is better back here than it was in the previous design. The scalloped front seat backs help and it'll certainly be easier than it was before to fit a large rear-facing child seat into the back here. Predictably, headroom still remains at something of a premium, but of course that's the case with most coupes. In this case, you'll probably be okay, provided you're not over six foot. The slight feeling of claustrophobia that afflicted some passengers in the rear in earlier generation versions of this car isn't quite as evident here, though the side rear windows, which remain electrically operable, are still tiny. A marginal lowering of this centre storage area between the seats helps to reduce the previous rather hemmed-in feeling. This box covered by a sliding lid one of the only cheap feeling fitments in the car. The top's reluctant to slide back, but once it does, uh, twin USB ports, a 12 volt point, and two cup holders are revealed. Otherwise, the quality back here is as faultless as it is up front, particularly if you specified these lovely quilted side panels and the configurable multicolored LED strip lighting. You don't get a center armrest, just this removable panel that you'd take off if you were using the ski hatch. There's space for a little bit of storage just behind it though. Let's take a look at luggage space out back, accessed via a power operated boot lid. Should you have specified the optional city specification pack, this can be activated by a wave of your foot beneath the bumper. If key in pocket, you happen to be approaching the car laden down with bags. As for actual capacity, well, despite this Mark III model's extra body length, there's exactly the same amount as there was before, 358 litres, which means that it's 88 litres larger than the trunk on offer in a rival Aston Martin DB11, but 42 litres smaller than the space you'd get in a rival Mercedes AMG S65. The floor falls away as it dips down towards this stainless steel lip, which will scratch easily, and there's no space below it to store anything else, despite the fact that Bentley declines to equip this car with any kind of spare wheel. There are four silvered tie-down points, a small Velcro strap on the back wall and a 12-volt socket. We'd want the optional battery trickle charger that's stored in this zip-up pouch here there to keep the battery topped up if you leave the car for long periods. You could take a couple of large suitcases back here and maybe also two smaller hold alls, but that's going to be a lot. There's unfortunately no option to push forward the rear seat backs and extend this space, but you can extend this area by using the removable ski hatch panel we mentioned earlier so that narrow, lengthy items can be accommodated. You won't be expecting Bentley craftsmanship to be inexpensive. It isn't. This model sits in an altogether more exclusive six-figure realm than it did in its previous generation guises. Priced at launch from around £157,000 for the W12 Coupe version we're trying here. That sounds a lot. It is a lot. But if you allow for inflation, you'll find that this car is actually a fraction more affordable than it was when it was first launched back in 2003, if that's any consolation. For a little less, you can talk to your dealer about a 4-litre V8 version, while if you've more to spend, there's a convertible body style. Your Bentley specialist can also brief you on the way that the brand has engineered petrol, electric, plug-in hybrid technology for this car too. As with any contender in this segment, the requested sticker figure is nothing more than just a starting point, as we'll discover shortly. On to market positioning. Now here, our focus is on the W12 Coupe, a 626 brake horsepower, 12-cylinder powerhouse of a GT that on the face of things loses little to a Ferrari GTC4 costing nearly £50,000 more, or a Rolls-Royce Wraith Coupe costing nearly £100,000 more. If you're referencing the previous generation Conti model, you might think that this car's closest rival would be the S65 V12 AMG version of the Mercedes S-Class Coupe, which costs over £30,000 more. Bentley, though, begged to differ, telling anyone who will care to listen that dynamically this car now has the sporting demeanour to match such as the Aston Martin DB11, which in V12 form costs about the same as this W12 Conti model and the Porsche 911 Turbo S, which is only about £10,000 less. 
Even with its newfound agility though, this Bentley, in its standard form anyway, still probably won't appeal to folk who might otherwise have been looking at super sports cars like the McLaren 570 GT, which costs about the same as this car or slightly less powerful, dynamically focused contenders that sit half a step down in the super sports market from this. Say cars like Audi's R8, the McLaren 540C, and more powerful versions of the Mercedes AMG GT, all models that would probably save you around 25,000 pounds. Ask your dealer about the much more focused GT3 version of this Bentley that the brand has been developing, if that's the kind of thing you want. Ultimately, we'd say that if what's on offer here really hits the sweet spot for you, and we can certainly see why it might, then you won't find anything else on the market that's quite the same. Having made that decision, you'll probably be mildly interested to know just how generous Bentley's been with the standard specification, so that you can establish just how much further box ticking is going to be required before a personalized version of this car can join the other exclusive models you'll doubtless already have residing in your oak timber-framed garage. Well, let's see. The standard spec gives you an eight-speed dual-clutch auto transmission, active all-wheel drive, and air suspension with adaptive continuous damping control and four height settings. There's also the Bentley Drive Dynamics Control Driving Mode System, which, via Comfort, Sport, or Bentley settings, allows you to alter ride quality, throttle response, steering feel, and gear change timings to suit your mood. You'll also get full LED matrix headlamps that adapt to the road, other motorists and driving conditions, plus full LED tail lamps, a deployable rear spoiler, twin oval stainless steel tailpipes, a powered boot lid and 21-inch 5 tri-spoke alloy wheels. Inside there are exquisite Bentley designed leather powered heated seats, an electrically adjustable steering column, laminated acoustic glass for the windscreen and side windows, a ski hatch and tread plates embossed with hand built in crew England. Plus, of course, all round parking sensors, climate control and auto headlamps and wipers. Infotainment is taken care of by a center dash color infotainment touchscreen that connects you into a 10 speaker, 650 watt, 11 channel DAB stereo system and a 60 gigabyte hard drive. Bluetooth lets you hook up your smartphone, there's Apple CarPlay, smartphone mirroring and you get a 4G mobile Wi-Fi hotspot as standard. The same 12.3 inch monitor also runs satellite navigation that features 3D building view graphics, along with traffic information and a Google point of interest search function. Plus, you can use voice or gesture control to change settings, such as the volume, or to zoom in without having to put a finger on the screen. As previously mentioned, all of this represents merely a starting point on the journey towards creating what is intended to be a completely bespoke product. So where to begin? Well, little disappointingly, the cabin's biggest talking point this time round, the Bentley rotating display, costs extra, a cool four and a half thousand pounds more, in fact. Still, you kind of have to have it if you're to experience everything the interior of this car has to offer. If you don't want to continually have to view that infotainment screen we just mentioned, this feature enables you to rotate it to a position where instead, this area of the dash shows three elegant analog dials. Or rotate the panel again to leave just a classy veneered fascia surface. The three positions each completely change the atmosphere of the cabin. Beyond that, well, it's really down to how far you want to go. The paint, leather and veneer options available are virtually unlimited and will be tailored to you as an individual. The standard palette alone includes 17 exterior paint colours. We've got sequin blue here, but verdant green, glacier white, St James red and orange flame also look great. In total, there are up to 70 hues potentially available in the extended paint finish range. You can also specify a bright chromed lower bumper grille, complete with a chrome strip, which is what we've got here. Inside, there's even more choice, 15 luxurious carpet options. We'd have the deep pile over mats that you can specify to sink your feet into at the front. And 15 choices of interior trim hide with different color splits. We'd also want to look at the softer semi-aniline leather finish you can have for the upholstery and the door inserts. Then there are the eight different handcrafted veneers, starting with Koa, Bentley's newest veneer, 
and also including burr walnut, tamo ash, and dark fiddleback eucalyptus. Or you can alternatively have those inlays finished in piano black, liquid amber, or dark stained madrona. To help those who can't decide, four unique dual veneer options are available for the first time. Here, we've got liquid amber over grand black. You can also personalize things further down the fascia in the area around the gear stick. For this area, we'd particularly want to look at the rather unique striped technical finish for the center console. Bentley calls it Coach de Genève. Also tempting is the diamond knurling specification, which adds an exclusive diamond-like crisscross finish to the bullseye vents, the organ stop fascia controls, and the clock bezels. Customers can also choose personalized stitching in the front and rear of the car, contrast stitching for the carpet binding, and personalized tread plates. The steering wheel can be ordered in single tone or duotone finishes with or without heating. If you want to go even further, a team of dedicated craftspeople at Mulliner, Bentley's personal commissioning division, are ready to create a cabin and an overall look to meet every need, if your pockets are deep enough. Wheels? Well, you can embellish them with red painted calipers. As for wheel size and styling, well, there are two further 21-inch alloy wheel options featuring a more intricate 10-spoke design. That's what we've got here. To get the larger 22-inch rims, though, you'll need to have specified the pricey optional Mulliner driving specification pack, which also includes unique diamond-in-diamond -diamond seat quilting, embroidered Bentley emblems, additional veneer options, a jeweled finish fuel filler, sports pedals, and an indented leather headliner. What else? Well, you're probably going to want to upgrade your car's audio system. Most Continental GT owners do. Possibly with the 16-speaker, 1500-watt Bang & Olufsen setup, but ideally with the 18-speaker, 2200-watt Name for Bentley premium package we've been trying here. An extra which will set you back over £6,600. Is any setup worth that? Well, all we can say is that we've never tried a better in-car audio system. Other things you might want to allow budget for include the comfort seat package, which adds extra adjustability and additional massage and seat ventilation options, and the optional mood lighting package, which allows you to bathe the interior in a choice of 14 different shades. You can broaden the scope of that center dash 12.3 inch screen by adding into it a TV tuner and maybe also a top view camera that will provide an overhead image of the car helpful for driving and maneuvering in tight spaces. Plus, you might well want a heated windscreen, an inductive phone charger, an interior air ionizer, an automatic parking system that will identify spaces and steer you into them, and a valet key which allows others to drive your car without giving them access to the glove box or the boot. We like the optional LED welcome lamps which project the Bentley emblem onto the ground when you open the door at night. And the welcome home lighting that sees the headlamps complete a bespoke sequence when you approach or leave the car. Also tempting would be the parking heater with radio remote control option that lets you set in advance the ideal interior temperature before you get into your car. If you're going to be grand touring, then you're probably also going to want the bespoke four-piece Beluga Portland luggage set that allow you to make the most of the space in the boot. Or if you're leaving this Bentley at home while you're away grand touring, then you might want the trickle charger for the battery that resides in its own zip-up pouch in the boot. We haven't mentioned autonomous driving kit, and that's because initially, at least, Bentley hasn't prioritized this to any great extent in developing this car, which is rather surprising given that the brand has access to all the technology that Audi is pioneering in this regard. Even more surprising is that the same comments apply to safety. All the usual electronic aids and airbags are, of course, present. But to be frank, we're surprised that so much of the camera-driven stuff you'd now expect to see as standard on a car of this price is relegated to the options list. Take autonomous braking, one of those setups that, as you drive, scans the road ahead in search of potential accident hazards, warning you if one's detected and, if necessary, braking the car to avoid a collision. We're a bit shocked that Bentley's system, Bentley Safeguard Plus, 
isn't standard, regardless of spec on all versions of this car. I mean, for goodness sake, it's standard on the cheapest Ford Focus these days. Still, you do get it as one of five features in the Touring specification pack that most customers choose, along with four other inclusions. A head-up display, lane assist, which steers you back into your lane should you drift from it, ACC, or adaptive cruise control, which automatically keeps you a safe distance from the car in front on the highway, and can work with predictive data from the navigation system, and night vision, which gives you enhanced forward vision after dark. Almost all Continental GT buyers also tick the further box for the City Specification Pack, which includes seven further features. City Assist, the first of them, allows this Bentley to effectively drive itself in low-speed traffic queues at up to 37 miles per hour, taking care of throttle and steering for you, as long as you keep at least one hand on the wheel, and using camera technology to keep the car in lane. It sounds futuristic, but if you have to regularly commute in stop-and-go traffic, it's a feature you'll really come to depend on. This works in conjunction with a pedestrian warning system, which scans the road and the pavements ahead as you drive for pedestrians or animals who might be about to inadvertently step out in front of you. If someone or something is detected, the car will warn you and, if necessary, automatically brake the car to avoid them. The third city specification pack feature is reversing traffic warning, which will alert you to oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. And there's traffic sign recognition, which pictures road signs you pass and displays them on the dash. The city specification pack also includes hands-free boot opening, allowing you to raise the boot lid with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper and automatic dimming mirrors. Plus, you also get the top view camera system we mentioned previously. Even Bentley isn't immune from the need to make its cars more efficient, hence the importance of the 80 kilogram reduction in weight that this third generation Continental GT enjoys over its predecessor, 50 kilograms of which comes courtesy of its lighter body shell. Were it not for the fact that extra high-tech kit has had to be added this time round, the saving would have been even greater. Perhaps we shouldn't get too excited. This, after all, is still a 2.2-tonne piece of Anglo-Teutonic real estate that, for all its sleek looks, actually has a chunky drag coefficient, 0.29 CD, five points down on the brand's slab-sided Bentayga SUV. But at least the crew concern has done what it can. Take the way that the W12 petrol engine we're trying here is 10.4% more efficient than the previous one and shuts down half its cylinders on part throttle loads so that most of the time what you're actually going to be driving is a six-cylinder Continental GT. There's also so-called intelligent coasting which, at a cruise on the highway, disconnects the engine from the gearbox, sending the car into a sailing style mode until you brush your foot against the throttle again. And you get a sophisticated engine start-stop system that works not only when the vehicle is stationary in traffic, but also at the frequent near-to-stop speeds that characterise regular progress in urban motoring. On the face of things with this W12 model, the results of all this effort don't appear to be huge in terms of the fuel and CO2 figures you actually get. You're looking at a CO2 return of 278 grams per kilometre, a 16% improvement over the W12 engine previous generation model, and a combined cycle fuel figure of 23.2 mpg, previously it was 19.9. That economy improvement will be more significant for a likely buyer, translating into a usefully longer range that would probably be between 350 to 450 miles between fills of the 90 litre fuel tank, depending on how you drove. By and large, Bentley owners don't care how much the thing will cost to fuel, but they are irritated by how often they have to bruise their brogues on filling station forecourts. The alternative 4-litre petrol V8 engine will obviously do a bit better than this, but not much. If you really want to slash those returns and be able to face the green lobby with more of a clear conscience, then you'll need to talk to your dealer about the plug-in hybrid powertrain that's been developed for this car. This combines a 3-litre V6 petrol engine with an efficient electric motor powered by a lithium-ion battery that can take you up to around 30 all-electric miles when fully replenished. 
Charging takes just two and a half hours from a designer-styled power dock that the brand will fit in your oak-timbered garage, but if you're charging from a conventional household power socket when out and about, you'll need to allow seven and a half hours to bring the battery fully back to speed. Whatever engine you select for your Continental GT, you'll need to be aware that, as ever, other factors will have more of an effect on the running cost you're taking on than the emission and fuel figures this Bentley generates. For a start, for road tax, you're going to be pitched right up into the priciest M designated band, while company car drivers will be looking at a top-rate 37% benefiting kind bracket and an associated annual tax bill that could be as much as £25,000 a year for users in the highest additional rate tax band. On a car this expensive, the really big ticket item though is always going to be depreciation. Industry expert CAP expect this car to retain around 56% of its value after three years. And if that's realised, it would see this Bentley outperforming comparable products like Aston Martin's DB11, 52%, the Rolls-Royce Wraith, 46%, and the Mercedes-AMG S65, 37%. You'll damage that showing hugely though by loading the car up with pricey extras. There'll be no getting out of pricey insurance premiums either. All versions of this Bentley are rated at Group 50 and servicing certainly won't be cheap. The intervals for both engines come round every 10,000 miles or 12 months depending on which arrives soonest. A two-year prepaid servicing package is available for about £2,000. This is all backed up by a three-year unlimited mileage warranty, which is pretty much par for the course in the luxury sector, although Rolls-Royce offers four years on its new cars. Continental GT buyers also get a roadside assistance package that, in the very unlikely event of a breakdown, will get you going or take your Bentley to an approved repairer. If it can't be fixed quickly, you'll be provided with a car to carry on your journey or even a hotel to stay in while the car is sorted. In bringing Bentley into a new era, the Continental GT has proved to be a hugely significant car and this third generation version is more desirable still. Purists may grumble at the Teutonic influence, but one can't help feeling that if W.O. Bentley's watching, he'd now be mighty proud of the car that bears his name. This model seamlessly blends the brand's glittering heritage with the latest technology to create a highly desirable package. Sure, you can create a slightly more driver-focused machine than this by compromising in certain areas, luxury, cabin space, refinement. Some other brands in this segment do. Bentley, though, hasn't been deflected from its quest to create the ultimate all-round GT, a car you could cross continents in, but one you'd also love to try on the odd twisting mountain pass or racetrack as you did it. Most of what we change here comes down to specification semantics. The Bentley rotating display is a core cabin element and should be standard. Plus, it's ridiculous that you have to pay extra for pretty ordinary elements of camera-driven safety kit. Otherwise, this British-designed and British-built paragon of sporting luxury is at last the car it should always have been. With previous models, driving dynamics for the enthusiast were way off the kind of thing a Porsche, an Aston Martin or a Ferrari would give you. This third generation Continental GT probably halves that gap, while further cementing its reputation as the market's premier long distance GT luxury sports car. It's quite an achievement. The German hierarchy, it seems, has finally got a proper handle on what a Bentley should be what the mark is all about. And British enthusiasts can finally relax. On this evidence, this famous name is in good hands.